boy, are you in for a treat today. We're going music, people. Language learning through body movement, music, and a whole lot of rhythm. You all probably know that TPR, total physical response, is one of the most powerful ways to raise learning acquisition. And I use the word acquisition intentionally because it implies learning the language organically. And Daniel Griffin is the person to call if you're ready to let your students acquire language with movement, dance, rhythm, and music. And hey, he's done all the work. He's already got the music lyrics and gestures all ready for you. All you have to do is make the call and magic begins to happen. Just listen to the passion Daniel has for including arts in your language classes, and I think you're going to be hooked. The stories Daniel tells about his concerts and the reception of his songs are going to rock your world. I'm not going to say more because we're going to start with a part of a compilation he prepared especially for this chat. And there'll be a link for it in the end so you can listen to each song more slowly. And so hear the beauty and integration of language and music designed for your students' highest learning experience. Ready? Earphones plugged in. Let's go. What fun, what fun that was. And also I love your movement. Can I just make a few comments? Sure. You have so many different elements in those songs and that's what we're gonna talk about. You have movement, you have fantasy animals, you have existentialism. <laughs> I love that only, there's only one race, the human race. You have fast and slow. Oh yes. Incredibly enthusiastic, really clear pronunciation, which is very important, especially in music. You have thank you and please song, which is going to begin a really interesting intercultural dialogue because you and I both live in Spain and we know how that goes in Spanish. It's just not expected. And yet in English, it's, it's very important. You have songs <laughs> with the preposition of movement. You have everything, Daniel, just everything. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Oh, I feel, I feel like I have many, many more to write. Yeah, variety is one of the big identifying characteristics of this project. I think it just stems from the fact that because I'm a musician and I have very wide ranging tastes as a listener, I don't like to say no to anything when I'm writing. So that if I feel like writing a heavy metal song or a 1940s jazz song or a reggae song, I just go ahead and write it. And the interesting thing about children, not even just young children, but even 10, 11, 12 year olds who are now starting to form their own musical tastes is that they're still very open minded. And they don't have all the social meaning of certain kinds of music that teenagers, it's like, well, I don't listen to that because it's not cool. It's not what I identify with. Younger kids, they don't have that. And they're just wide open. If they like the song, they like the song and that's all they care about. So people would look at me and think, you're not a rapper, but I do rap. And the kids, they like it. They think I'm a rapper. So I guess I'm a rapper. <laughs> all right. Well, Danny, tell us a little bit about your history. And then we're going to go back to all this music and how the students react to it, how the children react to it. And you have a whole routine. It's not just going in and singing to them. You have a whole preparation. But first of all, tell us where you're from. Tell us about your background and how music has just lit up your life. Uh, well, I'm from Chicago, born and raised. Um, I come from a not professional musical family, but amateur. Definitely my father in particular was he played the banjo, the guitar, the piano. He sang, he wrote music for his church. And there was just a lot of music going on. He listened to records. I'm the youngest of five siblings. They were all crazy music fans. So I absorbed all that music before I ever started thinking about it. Piano lessons were mandatory in my house. I didn't really like piano because I thought it was hard but it was great preparation for my later studies. When I, I was gifted a drum set in the sixth grade by a friend of my oldest brother when he went to college and that kind of changed my life because I just took to that like a fish to water. I was like, I'll never forget it. My mother was on the phone. She said, Daniel, come in here. And she's on the phone. She says, would you like Mike Steiner's drum set? I said, are you kidding me? 
I couldn't believe it. And that led you to play with one of the most famous bands in Spain. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Fito Fitipalis. Yeah, I was with him for 10 years. Well, that was a long and winding road, including almost 10 years where I stopped touring and playing the drums with anyone. I was exclusively doing children's music. And uh, that's kind of an odd way to get into sort of the biggest rock band in the Latin world. <laughs> but, um, you know, it did work. I was always in touch with people and I was still playing on my own and doing a few side projects. But yeah, it was a long and winding road. I studied classical percussion. I worked as a primary school teacher in a bilingual classroom in Chicago. I taught English to adults. I played in clubs in the 90s for a number of years singing. I was also doing some small tours as a drummer. It's, you know, I've done a lot. I, most musicians are like that. I think we we always seem to have a lot of irons in the fire. Well, I mean, one thing they say about music is that it stimulates so many parts of the brain. So it's not, and you, I mean, it, it shouldn't be surprising that you've had such a varied career. But then how is it that you started focusing on children? If you started with, I could, shouldn't say started, but you were with adults in the beginning and the band that you were drumming with is for a more adult audience, right? Well, I, I had been right out of college. I taught for three years, two of which was I was the homeroom teacher for primary in Chicago in bilingual classrooms. So I had that contact first before I thought about doing children's music. Then after that, I decided I want to be a musician. And about two years later, I was like, you know, I should do music for kids while I'm also doing this professional music career. Because I was playing clubs, there were small gigs, they were poorly paid. And it was a side gig. It was you're scraping and scratching to make a living as a club musician as I was then. And I thought schools would be a nice side gig. And so that's what it started like. It was just me and a guitar, no gestures, traditional songs, bingo and old McDonald's. And it grew very organically of the first four years. That's all I did. And I didn't have a lot of work. And then suddenly I started doing my own children's music, completely convinced that no one would want it. And uh, they liked it. I was really surprised by that. I was like, oh, really? You like this more than Old McDonald? Okay. And that started me down that path. I did hundreds of new songs and also producing old traditional songs for publishers here in Spain and also Oxford University Press. I do have a question about your primary school, the bilingual classroom <clears throat> in the States. Sure. Chicago. Did you speak Spanish then? Were you learning Spanish? Did you go... Yeah, I already was fluent in Spanish because I spent my junior year abroad. I'd studied it quite a bit. In, here in Spain? Yes, here in oh, Spain. Oh, okay. So, so you went back and you were able to apply that directly into the classroom. I was. I had bilingual classrooms for two years in Chicago, third and fourth grade, one year, fifth and sixth grade the other year with all possible levels. It was crazy. All possible levels of the language, you're saying? Of the yeah, language, okay. yes. You know, very recent immigrants from Mexico and South America, along with kids who had been born and raised in Chicago. It was it was the widest mix you could get. It was really challenging. I can only imagine. Yeah, I don't think of Chicago as is a place where there's a lot of bilingualism, but thank goodness they had you. Oh, there's a, there's a ton. There's a ton of bilingual. I mean, it has hundreds of thousands of, of Mexican-Americans, I know, and other South American populations. So, oh, yeah. Okay, so then you decided to come back to Spain. You... Yeah, I ended up, I was, I... When I came to study in college, which is my first contact with Spain, I met someone who I ended up marrying. So I had, was married to a Spaniard for many years. And that was really why I came and came back. And yeah, I mean, I, I when you're young, you don't have these grandiose plans. You're thinking, I'll go to Spain. I'm in love with this wonderful woman. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to go. I want to be a musician. And we'll figure it out. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I really didn't. No, the whole romantic idea. Sure. And it worked. Well, no. And the music idea either. I didn't know anything about music in Spain. You just show up and start meeting musicians and sitting in on gigs and saying, what's the scene like, guys? Who's looking for a drummer? And that's the way it is for musicians generally. And uh, you just build it from there. The, the ironic thing is that the producer who called me for what was probably the biggest rock gig in Spain in 2008 was someone I met during those very first few years in Spain when, quote unquote, he was nobody and neither was I. We were just doing small time gigs. Well, that guy later blew up. He's been probably the hottest rock producer in Spain for the last 15 years. And he liked the way I played. Well, but you, who knew that he liked it so much? It's just, I guess the lesson is if you're in the game and you're working hard, something is eventually going to happen. The universe apparently, and I found this to be true as, as well, the universe responds to passion. So I, I would agree. Yeah. You, you don't necessarily believe that when you're having difficulties with making money and stuff like that. My wife was always fantastic about it. She supported me financially sometimes and def and morally, you know, she was always like, this is what you love to do. Keep at it. I'm okay. I make enough. And she was wonderful always. And that was a big part of it too. I have to say that. I don't think I would have abandoned ship, but I certainly would have had more struggles. It's a hard thing to do to make a living in music. It's not easy. <laughs> 
I love it. I don't have no regrets, but it can be tough. And you have two big projects. And you even said to me, which one would you like to talk about first? All of your songs that are really well and clearly compiled on a website you have, and then your concert. Apparently you see them as two different factors. I see them as just two different ways for people to find your music and use it educationally. So which would you like to talk about first? Well, I guess I could talk first about the concerts project because the other one grew out of that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So you started to do concerts and what you explained to me, because I had the, just the honor and just so much fun talking to you on the phone a few weeks ago before oh. you went back to visit your family back to the States. Aren't you glad you came back to Seville in the summer? I don't know how <laughs> you planned that one. You need to rethink that. Daniel. Yes, it's so cold. But it's not just going in and singing. There's a whole structure to this and you've really thought this out. So can you tell us about about it, please. Sure. So schools call me to book a concert, which is usually many months after that. I, they call in September usually. It's usually in the second half of the school year. I send them the what used to be the CD. Now it's all digital, virtual. And they choose the songs from that album and decide which ones they're going to prepare, usually six or seven or eight songs. And because it is foreign language, it's very different. I can't just show up and do a concert because the kids won't understand what I'm saying. Even some higher level kids won't really understand and they won't get the gist of the songs and the humor I might use when I speak. So it needs a lot of preparation in the classroom and teachers, it's highly varied how much time they take to prepare. It can be a few weeks if it's really high level school. Some people do it right from September. They sort of put in a little bit at a time into the regular class structure. That just depends. And the one thing that might not be as obvious to people who don't know the project is that besides the music, I write songs to have TPR movements with every single line. So that I write every song to be dramatized or gestured to every single line of every single song, which as far as I know, and I would love for someone to correct me if I'm wrong, no one else has done, at least in English. I'm always surprised that no one has taken ESL songs and said, let's make gestures the basis of what we're doing, as opposed to something we slap on later as an afterthought. Or, well, if there are some words that can be gestured to, yeah, we'll do those. But then there are these three lines that there is just no gesture for because it wasn't written that way. So I, I write the lyrics so that they can be gestured to. That is an integral part of this, which means that the school concerts are, the kids are constantly moving, constantly doing gestures and dance movements and singing which can be, depending on which songs the teachers have picked, it's a really rocking, high energy, super loud affair, which is a ton of fun for the kids and for me. And that's it. So it's, it's movement and music. Those are the two things. So teachers prepare that and it takes some extra time, but I, I, make, I try to make it worth it for them. The lyrics are all based on the major publisher's content. So I don't just write random lyrics. They're made for the EFL, ESL classroom. I find that such an important element in your work because you probably know this, that moving is the way the brain learns better. From the moment of conception, we are moving yes. in the liquid in our mommy's stomach. Uh -huh. And so the more we move, even into adulthood, the more we learn. And so your question was, you're not sure if anyone else has done this. I couldn't answer that concisely. But I do know that when I go into the classroom and teachers are listening to songs, they usually have to invent the gestures right. and right in the moment. And right. it doesn't work right. really well. Right. It works yes. fairly well, but not really well. So when you add this element, all of a sudden, you're helping teachers exponentially. Yeah, it's a very powerful tool, as, as any teacher who uses TPR a lot knows. It just surprises me that people don't do more of it. Well, that's why you're so under demand. <laughs> and so you send them the lyrics and you send them the movements. Do you send them videos to show them the movements? We are going to do that at some point in the future. I have a real dilemma because there's so much material on my website which is related to the concerts, that we don't want to do cheap videos and we have to do over a hundred of these videos right now. So it's described line by line in writing. And what usually happens is teachers look at it once or twice, they get the gestures in their head and that's it. They don't need to be depending on that PDF, but we write them out and the teachers learn them. Okay. In, in one sense, as a literature teacher, that works for me because the more they're actually reading, really, yeah. it is raising their vocabulary as well. So a video is easier but just because it's easier doesn't mean we have to do it. Right, I, I mean, we, we are going to do videos. We're trying to figure out the best way to do it. You know, we're an independent project, we're small, we don't have a massive budget. And again, we have to do over a hundred of those videos. So you started the concerts and then you said, out of those concert grew your webpage and you have how many songs are uploaded onto your webpage? And can you explain a little bit about how we would maneuver ourselves around that? Where would we begin? 
Uh, well, it's dancingenglish.com. It is a subscription website, so you subscribe monthly or yearly, and you have access. It is 112 songs currently, which is about like 11 CDs worth of music. I think we have 300 pages of worksheets, another 300 pages of flashcards. We have the gestures for every song. So again, you're talking about every single line of every single song for 112 songs, with some rare exceptions, has a TPR gesture that was written for that song. So that's a really powerful tool. And yes, we will be putting up videos. I would not dare to say when, I'm guessing in the next six to 12 months. That's the gist of it is music and videos, which are lyric videos. And I should say that all of the music for this project, again, with a few rare exceptions, it's always three times through the song and the third time is a karaoke version with an instrumental melody and no voice because teachers really demand that. And age is important too as well, because there are so many songs geared towards the younger students. And I would say maybe 10 and younger, and you specifically yes. gear your songs. You have songs for the young listeners, but you specifically gear them for older listeners. Is that right? Yes. And that has been sort of a, a historic uh, issue for me. You know, I've been doing concerts for 25 years. I used to do all the way up to eighth grade, which were 14 year olds and they would have mustaches and they'd be six feet tall. Now where I am in Spain, it's down to sixth grade, which are 12 year olds max. And it has always surprised me how people will say, oh, well, they don't like to do music. You know, it's kids music. The, the fifth graders, the sixth graders are too old for that. And that is totally not my experience. If you get the right songs for them, and, you know, the teacher has to be someone who tends to be more an active, involved teacher who sings and dances. That helps a lot. But I have had absolutely raucous, rocking, crazy high energy shows with those kids. You know, so people who say, well, they don't like to do this kind of music. I just think they haven't tried the right kind of music. And I have a lot of music for upper primary. In fact, half the project is really conceived for upper primary and the other half is for preschool and lower primary. And what about secondary? Have you touched on that yet? That is a long-term goal of mine. I would love to. I just don't have the time. <laughs> I would love yeah. to. Yeah. The language is much more wide open for them, so it would be fun. And as a teacher, when I was trying to find really entertaining things to do, we always go to music. I mean, music is the way to capture the attention of the students. First right. of all, I realized that my taste is way back from when I was a teenager, which is a long time ago. Sure. And the second thing is most of the songs are going to have very colloquial meanings or, or terms right. or pronunciation. And right. it, I mean, a great example is I know a lot of people who love Bob Dylan. I right. am not one of those people. I find him incredibly hard to understand, but <laughs> even he does not pronounce, he doesn't enunciate. I agree with you. Yes. He's a great songwriter, but I, yeah, he's a little bit tough to understand. The point is that it's challenging. It's really challenging to just go out and find songs. Yes. Whereas what you're doing is you are birthing songs for the purpose of an ESL classroom, but you're not condescending to them. You are oh. introducing language and ideas that are really intriguing. Yeah, I think of it as real language. Nina Lauder is the uh, author of a lot of the worksheets for this project. And uh, she's obviously much more, you know, she's an author of many textbooks and a lot of ELT material. She says, this is really real language. You should describe it to people as using real language because you're not making your songs like level specific. We're just going to do this language from third grade or fourth grade. I do limit the language, but I don't mind pulling in things that are quote unquote inappropriate once in a while if it feels natural. There's something someone was telling me at one of the publishing companies and she used to work for Oxford. Now she works for Macmillan. There's something called parsley terms. And I'd never heard that before. Uh -huh. And those are terms that you're not really supposed to use and it seems like you are daring to use them appropriately i think the thing that i speak about that surprises some people is i have a fair number of songs about values i have songs that are very explicit about racism about the environment about social justice in a very broad sense but it's about violence poverty hunger greed lying stealing it's very upfront but that song is not written for four and five-year-olds that is for 10 11 12 year olds in particular who intellectually can very much they know what we're talking about. They have plenty of intellectual capacity to look at the world and say, wow, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Your kids are not as innocent as they were when we were younger. 
Right. I've worked with Nina and I didn't know she was working with you and she's going to be on the podcast in a few weeks if we oh. could just plan it. Nina's she has so many projects going that yeah, it's she's hard the best. to- She's a mile a minute. Nina is, every time I talk to Nina, I'm like, I end up with four pages of notes because she has so many ideas for the project. I'm like, stop, I can't do all this for the next three years. I know. And she does not <laughs> drink coffee because she's already buzzing no, all no, the no. time from the minute she wakes <laughs> no, up. No, no, she's amazing. I'll have to make a note of that and ask her about her work with you. I'm sure she'll be effusive. So how is the process? Do you send the teachers a list of possible songs or do they actually request certain songs? Because this about race and about what were the other things you were saying that are a little bit controversial? Well, the environment, racism, you know, sharing is like a value song for the littler kids, right. the concept of right. sharing. I have several songs that are anti-violence, anti-bullying, anti-war, pro-peace. Wow, how controversial. <laughs> I don't think those are controversial at all. I mean, but yeah, I mean, people can, can make their own judgments about that. But yeah, I mean, that's because this project is, I've written everything, so. So you're including your values in it. And so yeah. what you have them on the webpage and the teachers find the songs that they are more attracted to, or do you suggest some of them? The website, which is available to anyone who might be listening to your podcast around the world is, is sort of a separate thing because the concerts are currently only available in Spain, which is where I live. And we send them just one of the albums that I have done over the years. And they choose from that album. That used to be because it was we all, we would have CDs. I may rework that format in the next year or two. But I honestly, I have so much material that some teachers are like, would you just tell me what ones to do? And I say, well, I, I don't want to do that because you know your students and one sixth grade class is very different from another one. And it just varies radically in my experience. I cannot believe the differences from school to school. And then the concert itself, because you're saying it's not just the songs, you're also talking to them. So what I'm wondering is, are the stories you tell scripted as well so that they know what to expect? Or can you be a bit spontaneous? Oh, I try to be spontaneous because, you know, just as a stage performer, generally, if you're doing something people have already seen or just expect, you've removed a very big element of attraction, which is the element of surprise, what's going to come out of his mouth. So here in Spain, I will mix in a little bit of Spanish to facilitate, you know, the flow of the show itself or humor. They need to find me attractive when I show up that like they need to say this guy's I want to keep watching him for the next 45 60 minutes. So, you know, the first five minutes actually I'm speaking I'm we're doing a lot of repetition. I'm basically pulling them into me and getting this dynamic going where I get them repeating stuff because throughout the concert, we're going to be repeating a ton of language. You know, I don't have time to stop and discuss and explain that that doesn't work in a show It works in a classroom. But in a show, it's a different dynamic. When you're saying you need to be attractive to them, they need to feel comfortable in yes. your presence. And yes. so I think it's really important that you just said that you speak some Spanish to them. Yeah. Because a lot of ESL teachers think that any home language in the classroom is forbidden. Yes. And it's not true. What we want is for them to, you know, the limbic system to relax so that new information goes in or anything they've been learning, they'll be able to process it and use their bodies and enjoy the time with you. Yeah. So first of all, I think that's wonderful that you're sharing that. Yeah. You use a little bit of Spanish, but then to pull them in, can you explain, for instance, just give us an example of how you open a show. Well, the, the way I open a show is actually not varied much for many years because it's effective for what I want, which is, again, it's not a class. A few teachers have trouble understanding that as relates to why are you speaking Spanish? I say, well, this is not a class. This is a different thing altogether. It's a show. And I need to hit them and go, boom. And the kids need to feel an impact and want to be hanging on my every word when I'm speaking and singing. You know, it's a very different dynamic. So what I do at the beginning of the show is I end up speaking. There's some there's some humor. I get them to sing a little bit and warm up their voices, which they find funny. I do a very quick scale. How am I going to get them? I need to get them to pay attention, to repeat everything I say, repeat everything I do. So I started with body parts. Show me your hands. Raise your hands, close your hands, two fingers, touch your head. I, I go through this kind of stuff. And what I'm doing is pulling them in. And then I do a few jokes, you know, grab your neck. Ah, that always works. It's a gag, you know, it's physical humor. They're little things. It's, it's stagecraft, really. So that by the time that first song hits, they're with me. I've tried this a number of times in the past where I don't do anything. I walk on stage and I start singing and I never manage to pull them in the same way. I don't understand even why that is, but uh, this is not 
a native language concert. It's a foreign language concert. And they don't understand even some of the, a lot, I think, or some of the things they're singing, even though they've been studying them, particularly the smaller kids. Even though they've prepared the song and they've seen it with their teacher, they don't necessarily know what they're singing. They have a vague idea sometimes. Some really know, but there is a highly variable level of comprehension. Well, I don't know the science behind it, Daniel, but I would just say that if you're coming in and just starting to sing, and then it's really about you. But if you come in and you're asking them to recognize their own body parts, yeah. which they've been learning since preschool, yeah. by the way, in another yeah. language, and to move, again, you're asking them to move yeah. and you're speaking to them. You're you're probably looking a lot of them in the eyes. Always. You're noticing their movement. And so you're making an emotional connection with them. Yeah, and absolutely. And that's how you're pulling them in. I mean, they feel seen from the minute you walk in on the stage, apparently. Yeah. You know, uh, I like kids. That's big. Not, not everyone in education does. We all know that. There are a few people out there. You, you wonder what they're doing in a classroom. But I really like kids. And I still, you know, I've done over 3,000 concerts and there is some elements of repetition. But what's always fresh for me is the group of kids I have in front of me, which is the same thing when you're performing rock and roll. I've performed for tens of thousands of people at a time. And it doesn't exactly get repetitious, but you know, 15,000 one night in Madrid, 18,000 next night in Barcelona. Well, you can't see most of the people. You know what I mean? You focus on the ones you can see and the great time that they're having. And kids are the same way. It, I don't know. I just, that to me is just instinctive. I really never thought about it. If I'm looking at a kid, I'm pulling them in. I'm saying, come on, let's have fun. Do this, you know, get up. If they're, you know, some kids are like, I don't want to do this. And you, depending on the child and the age and the attitude, you can pull them in or you can't. If you believe that we're all connected and, you know, one big soul, just different bodies, and they can feel your passion and your genuine care you have for them. Yeah. Interesting. And the crux of this is that they're prepared. Have you ever gone in where they're not as prepared as you hoped they were? Because it's got to be a completely different dynamic. Uh, yeah, sure. It's happened a number of times. I mean, I've been doing this for a lot of years since the 90s. So it happens for a variety of reasons. It tends to happen more towards the end of the school year when teachers just get overwhelmed with so much stuff they have going on. Even schools that I know have great teachers and are really great about the project. Sometimes if I show up late in the school year, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. We really didn't get to your material as the way we'd like. So yeah, it's a very different dynamic. And you know, sometimes it happens that a teacher gets sick or pregnant or whatever, and they didn't prepare anything at all. And that's where I could really tell the difference. I reaffirm on those mornings how important it is to prepare because the kids, you can tell are interested and like it, but they're looking at me like, what is this? because it's foreign language that they, they don't get it. So most schools do a really good job and a very large number of schools. I mean, when I show up, it's like Ed Sheeran or Mick Jagger have walked in the door. The kids are absolutely nuts about this concert. That is a credit to the teachers because they have taken advantage of the event that is a concert and pumped the kids up on the affective side to get them interested in these texts that they're trying to teach them, right? That's the whole thing. We want them to know these texts when the concert motivates them in the classroom prior to the concert to focus on these texts. So if you have a kid who's like, I want to go to that concert, I want to sing that song, and I want to hear it 10 times in the car on the CD, that's fantastic. That's an incredible level of motivation. And, and I get a lot of that from the kids. You know, they ask for my, they ask for my autograph. They want to hug me. And it's just, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Then you really have this personality on the stage that they really can feel your, you know, your humanity. I think that's gorgeous. And they're probably playing your songs right now in the car with their parents. I hope so. Some parents, <laughs> uh, that drives them crazy, but yeah. The parents are learning <laughs> along with their children. So, that's right. so tell us a little about the process, Daniel, because that, what I'm curious about is you have a team. You said it's a small team. Yeah. Which do you like best? The composing, the recording, the instrumental, the vocals? What do you like best? That's a hard question for me because I think part of my uh, problem in life as a musician is that I have ADD. When I'm playing the drums after time, I want to sing. And when I'm singing after time, I want to write. And when I'm writing after time, I want to go produce. <laughs> and I'm always on a merry-go-round of interest. So I guess I tend to like what I'm doing at the time. I get to work doing something I love and it has various facets to it. And I still love performing. All right. Well, let's go back to a really basic question. And there's no one answer. There are a lot of different answers. You are an educator. You've expanded your educational vision through music. So what could you say? What is the definition of education for you? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. What is the definition of education? 
Well, I guess if we weren't in this particular context, I would say that the main goal of education is to teach you how to think, you know, looking at the world and how it is in my experience, I would say that would be the main goal, but that covers so many different things. And I also think it should help make you a whole person which apparently, at least in the United States, you know, the humanities are something people study less and less at the college level. I studied poetry and, and music, and I, I think that's really a shame. I think the humanities are what really teach you to think. And part of it is because it exposes you to so many different fields. It forces you to be well-rounded. It forces you to take different perspectives. And ah, that's a tough question. It's your vision. It's not a, there isn't one yeah. vision. Everyone has a different definition. And I love that you said to think because you and I both know that in the educational system in Spain, it is changing, but most of yeah. it is memorization. Yes. Such a huge focus on memorization. It's very important to include critical thinking in the material. Yeah. And that's one of my huge fulcrums in my workshops is to give students agency, to yeah. give them responsibility. Otherwise, they yeah. leave the classroom. They don't know what to do. Right, and right. you were talking about liberal arts and in the States, I don't know what the educational system is right now, but when I was in college, same as you, I was liberal arts major. Yeah. I, I leaned towards ed literature at the end, but I at first I thought, why liberal arts? You know, it's really broad. Yeah, yeah. But I had a student, I worked at the American school here in Valencia and not many students, I could count them on one hand, yeah. went to university over my five years there in the States. And one of the students went to the States and she was a political science major, but she went to a liberal arts education. She okay. went to Georgetown, liberal arts. Nice. And her comment was when she came back to talk to her friends, and you know, in Spain that the studies are very compartmentalized. Yes. And her comment was, I don't have anything to talk about with my friends. Huh. All they're talking about is their study. Specialty. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that is a real difference. You know, I spent one year in the Spanish university system, but that was in the 80s. Totally different system. So the humanities are kind of dying. And I think it's, a you know, on a societal level, to me, it's a mistake. The arts are really in philosophy and history. It's about communication. It's about thinking. It's about taking a global perspective about not being hyper specialized. You want your doctor not to only see his or her narrow little field and have a global perspective. I mean, it's just a habit of thinking. And I, getting back to what I do, I feel like music and the arts generally are, should be a major part of that. One of my siblings is a theater person and runs a unusual to not for profit. They do theater for social change with adolescents. He said, you want a responsible teenager, get the kids who do music and theater in high school. They show up on time. They've got initiative. They organize amongst themselves. They're super productive. They work like crazy. He's like, they've got all the things that you want a worker to have. And they're doing it because they're in the arts, not because they're on a sports team. It was an interesting argument. I think that was what my high school experience was like in band. I was my own manager when I was 16 years old. I was calling adults and negotiating contracts because I wanted gigs. And it's because I was a musician and we wanted to play out and work. It just came naturally. It integrated a ton of skills into being a musician. And it's also, it's digging into who you are. And so what your parents did is not just insist you learn the piano and other instruments, they let you express yourself so, oh, through yes. those instruments. Oh, yes. And so, as you were saying, your brother who's in the theater, and I've heard other stories about the theater, letting students develop such a myriad of skills and becoming more responsible. I'm not surprised what you're saying. But what I, my experience is, and yours probably too, is that music is so compartmentalized in schools, music yeah. and the arts. You yeah. know, in primary school, what do they have? A couple of hours a week at the most of music? Yeah, way too little, way too little. There are some schools, there's one school in particular that comes to mind here in Madrid in, in the, the town of Colmenarejo, and they have a spectacularly wonderful children's chorus. I think it's all fifth and sixth graders. They're incredibly talented. And it's this public school with these two music teacher guys who are really committed and I went to that school not knowing anything about it. I happened, curiously enough, I happened to do my concerts the day after that chorus had just won the Madrid Region School Chorus or School Choir Contest. They had won the day before, so the kids were elated. And I start my concert, and from the first note, I look around, I'm like, what is this school? They sang perfectly in tune. Every kid was singing. It was like I was with a choir. 
And I said to the guy later, I said, what is up with your students? These guys, and he said, well, you know, our choir, blah, blah, blah. And what those teachers are doing with those kids is, is just amazing. I mean, we're talking extremely high level contemporary classical music that they do with their choir. And I see that and I think, oh, why can't we do this with every school or some version of that with whatever visual arts or the theater? The kids are so excited. They're so pumped. They're so motivated. You know, they're not just sitting on their screens. So I'm all for it. I wish they would fund the arts way more in this country and every country. In the meantime, we want them to find you and they can ask you <laughs> to come in for concerts and yes. we, we can make sure you, we're going to give them the links for the web page. Okay. How would you like to move forward in the next three or four years? What would you like in your professional life and in the schools? What are your ideal world scenario? Ideal world would be that Sting would call me for a tour. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. No, I'm a big... Don't say that. Don't right. say that. Just say the first part. <laughs> Sting is one of my idols. Well, certainly the website, we will continue to expand. We launched it this school year. Uh, we want to do way more than what we have. We want to put a whole craft section, a whole game section. We're going to do videos with the gestures, whether animated or actual people doing gestures. We don't know yet, but there's a ton of stuff we want to do with the website. So that's one thing. I will continue to do my concerts here in Spain. So I I, I guess I would just keep doing the same, but more of it. I will say one thing I would love to do. I so hope we can get this going, which is I feel like I, you can hear in the music now on my website, a series of new voices. We remixed a bunch of material. I went to the United States and found four fantastic singers and we re-recorded about so far half the material that's on that website and we're remixing. We're about to release another album of new mixes of old material, but with new mixes and new voices. What I would like to do is do live performances with four different singers, two men and two women. And I would love to start taking this out. And my, my goal is to get four young, super energetic, bouncy people who just pump up the kids and do bigger shows. You know, because in my shows, when the teachers, which happens frequently, when the teachers pump the kids up emotionally and prepare the kids, it is a riotous experience for the kids. They are absolutely beside themselves with glee, like, let's do more of this. And they ask for encores. So that energy behind learning a foreign language, I think it could really be, if we take it really big, it would be just a lot of fun. I'm still a little fixated on Sting calling you. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for making this time and oh, for thank you. sharing on the music we're going to hear the music in the beginning we're going to play a little bit in the end great daniel thank you so much we're going to pick up on this again great. in the next couple of years so we can make sure that you've had your duet with sting <laughs> we'll put, we'll put on the podcast wouldn't that be nice yeah <laughs> okay well thank All you right, donna thanks, i daniel. appreciate your interest in the project and and uh, i really appreciate you helping to get the word out about music oh my goodness yeah. it's a pleasure pleasure the only race is the human race the only race is the human race oh Want more music in the curriculum now? Do you want more arts in each lesson after everything you've heard today? Has Daniel convinced you or not of the magic that can happen when we include both in our lessons? What an adventure we've been on. I cannot wait to go to one of his concerts myself, although I'll have to learn the gestures so I'm not left out of all the fun. And I encourage you to check out Daniel's website and call him for a concert in your school. I think it might be one of the best decisions you'll make this school year. In the meantime, you can find more inspiring conversations like this one at Doorways to Learning with Donna and activities to scaffold things like Daniel's songs at scaffoldingmagic.com. Have fun in your classes and at home and see you next week for another conversation that will change your life or at least your view on what's possible in education. Hello, See you soon. Friends. How are you? Time to start the show. Let's go, go, go. Hello, hi.